Blow Your Mind Botany, Amazing Life, Life of Plants. And of course, it's a very appropriate time because we have a birthday coming up. And if you haven't, you need to get out to the surrounding hills because we have an amazing showing of wildflowers out there. So now we'll introduce Joe. In 1974, Joe was hired by MJC professor and Great Valley Museum founder Stan Elks to be program director for the Great Valley Museum. And the Great Valley Museum, I know many here know, it used to be at the corner of Stoddard and College. And it has its new location here on the West Campus. But it was an amazing little, uh, it was little, but it was an amazing place. So Joe became its um, a full-time biology professor. And um, after the retirement of Professor Don Drake from MJC in 1976, so then Joe also became the Great Valley Museum Executive Director, and he continued to do that through his tenure at Modesto Junior College. And I know that there, there are a lot of former colleagues, former, uh, not former friends, and friends, <laughs> <laughs> and also maybe even former students out in the audience. So there, a lot of hands may go up. Could I get a show of hands of people that have worked with Joe, or took a class from Joe, or? Science on Saturday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yay. <laughs> okay. So during his many years at MJC, Joe championed the protection of thousands of acres of native grasslands, which are now part of the San Luis Island National Wildlife Refuge and also the Great Valley Grassland State Park. Joe left Modesto Junior College in 1990 for Sierra College in Rockland. There he taught full-time until 2008. Then he became part-time and worked to expand the Sierra College Press. Today, the Sierra College Press is one of only a few academic presses at a community college. Joe retired in 2020, but still serves on the board of the Sierra College Press. Before I welcome Joe, I have a short anecdote that someone shared with me, one of his former colleagues. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> um, so soon after, no, there's no uh-oh oh, there, Joe. <laughs> soon after Joe was hired at Sierra, um, Joe, as uh, has, has often done, was leading a field trip. And on this field trip with his, was his new dean, along with a few MJC cronies, and all along the field trip, his dean, his new dean, declared, when we hired Joe, we hired the best darn biologist in the state. <laughs> so I'd like to welcome Joe. OK. I'll talk on, yeah, I can talk on this one now. So, Wow, thank you very much. For, for that. I'm happy to be here and uh, very pleased to try to make this uh, presentation to you. But I'm going to start moving through it by, uh, very, very quickly, um, as, if, I, if I may, because I have uh, a lot that I would like to share with you. Um, I started out here, if anybody remembers Ted Woods, and Ted Wood was the zoology instructor here. And uh, re he was really just an amazing uh, guy. And, and uh, the, the biology department there took us all uh, you know, on, on so many field trips. And we went out to the coast. And I just fell in love with marine biology. And I thought that I was going to be a zoologist until I started cutting into these things. And everything smelled like formalin. And there was blood everywhere and all of this. And so I, uh, so I, I kind of changed over to botany. But I really do uh, appreciate those, those naturalists. Uh, that, they really were naturalists. Uh, back at uh, Modesto Junior College when I, when I first started uh, back then. So I was uh, actually uh, born in Rhode Island, the little estate, but then I moved out here to California in the San Joaquin Valley where it was hot as Hades. And um, I was sick most of the time. I was raised on a dairy and uh, sick most of the time. And you know, it seemed like I was in the hospital more than I, than I wasn't. 
And they, back in those days, they finally gave you those uh, scratch tests to find out what you were allergic to, you know? So they scratched all up and down my back and three welts showed up and uh, just giant. And they said, well, you're not allergic to anything but three things, but you're really allergic to these three things. And what are they? And then, well, it turned out that it was cattle hair, alfalfa, and milk. And <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, right then I knew I was in the, in the wrong place. And it didn't take me long to beg my parents to let me leave 4-H and get into the Boy Scouts. And it was the Boy Scouts that helped me. My father just could not believe no son of his was going to sleep on the ground out there, you know. And, but all I could see was that magnificent uh, Sierra Nevada out there. And that's where I wanted to go, and that's where I wanted to be. And uh, that's what has kept me uh, going, um, you know, for, for all, of, all of my life. Well, you know, after uh, teaching botany and ecology and a number of things over, over many years, I, I finally realized that uh, we don't pay enough attention to plants. I don't know why. They're the most important thing that's out there. Why we don't say prayers daily to the chlorophyll molecule, you know, for, for <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, you can say prayers to other things too, if you other, I mean, whatever. Um, but, uh, but chlorophyll and photosynthesis, you know, what, where would we be uh, without it? So uh, I dedicate this uh, to my grandkids first. This, this, this is uh, my wife Lynn and my uh, two grandsons, Pope and Hazen. Uh, I brought Pope with me. We're, we're leaving here for a vernal pool field trip going south uh, in the next few days. And my little Thule, my uh, youngest uh, uh, at nine years old, uh, up, in, up in Portland. But I dedicate this uh, to them and to all the other tree huggers that are out there. Uh, this is a colleague of mine up on, on a juniper up in the Sierra Nevada. You probably have seen this tree uh, yourself if you've walked around Olmstead Point and seen these magnificent 2,000-year-old uh, uh, trees up there. Um, this tree could easily be a couple of millennia, and I could take my whole field botany class and crawl inside this thing. Uh, rather magnificent. I'd also like to dedicate this uh, presentation to all the very hard-working uh, uh, ethnobotanists that are working to reunite uh, uh, the uh, ethnobotany and Native American management of, of, uh, of uh, the California flora and all of the, of the flora and, and the incorporation of, of Native American wisdom and Native American management in the health of, of our uh, world. And here's three, uh, Tending uh, the Wild is by Kat Anderson, who's from UC Davis, retired there now. Uh, Nancy Turner uh, from British Columbia. And then if you have not read, of, of the, over on the right, see, raise your hand if you've read Braiding Sweetgrass. Yeah, the rest of you need to go out and buy that book and uh, read uh, Braiding Sweetgrass. At the very beginning of Braiding Sweetgrass, uh, the, the author, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is a scientist, at the uh, uh, State University of New York in Syracuse. She's also a Native American, but she was raised as a non-Native person. Her father was taken to the Carlisle School, stripped from his nativity, and uh, told that he had to leave his uh, Native American culture and become essentially a colonist like everybody else. And so she's reuniting, reconstructing her past um, and trying to work through, uh, you know, understanding, her own understanding of being a Native American. At the very beginning, there are many, many uh, creation stories, of course, but uh, the, the very first part of the book tells two stories. Uh, a story of Sky Woman uh, coming from the sky, falling uh, through the clouds and being captured by uh, uh, so many geese very carefully laying her down amongst all these other animals. And you probably heard the the uh, Turtle Island story many times in many different ways before, but a, a very wonderful uh, 
uh, creation uh, myth uh, story. But then the, uh, the story that we all know so well is Adam and Eve. And the, the point that she's trying to make here is what happened? Here's two women given these bounties of, of natural history and biological diversity and so on. But one gets the short end of the stick. One is driven from the Garden of Eden. The other is told to tend it. And the other is driven from it. You know, So she goes on from there, but very, very carefully puts this story together. Well, way back when, many, many tens of thousands of years ago, we must have all been animists. And animists then, we, we appreciated every living thing, including all every non-living thing as well, <clears throat> including rocks and rivers and trees and clouds and storms, um, as well as plants and animals and so on. But then, you know, it didn't take long before we became polytheists, right? And the Greeks and the Romans helped us out with this. There was a god for this and a goddess for that and, uh, you know, and so many different uh, gods that, uh, that would be in control of so many different things. And then, of course, we worked our way into monotheism and the, the major monotheistic uh, cultures of today. But something else happened along the way. <clears throat> and, it's, and it perhaps started along in this uh, in this type of, uh, of a story situation. What's missing here on the ark? I'd like to ask you, uh, just blurt out, what's missing? There's two by two going up there, what? No plants. There's no plants. They're leaving them all behind, right? Or, you know, maybe there might be some pollinators in there, but there's, you know, there, there's no plants, and that's a critical error. Uh, you know, uh, since we base all of our life on plants. And so the philosophers uh, go on and on and on, and they start naming species, and they start putting uh, organisms in a hierarchy, right? Who's the most advanced? Who's the most important? Who's the lowliest? And Democritus and Aristotle and Pliny the Elder and so on, they all recognized living things. They recognized that they, many of them had motion, many of them grew, many of them re, uh, reproduced and so on. But of course in the 1500s we had to put them in this, <clears throat> in this uh, hierarchical order on the, on the outsides here, you just exist or est, you know, you don't, you're a rock, you don't move, you have no significance whatsoever. A little farther in, okay, we're noticing that you're alive, you know, you grow a little bit or whatever, so we're going to put you into the life category, the vivid, and then of course other things, you know, we've got some motion and sent it, so you're sentient, you can you know, actually sense things and feel things and receive the information and so on, but nothing, you know, those are just animals and things of that nature, but until you get to the top, us, of course, and, uh, you know, we are the ultimate species uh, to be uh, at the very tip top you know, way above and being able to look down upon all these other uh, much lowly, much more lowly species. Well, then anybody that's ever had a biology class knows that Carl von Linné, who changed his name later to Carolus Linnaeus so that he could make his own binomial, of course, <laughs> uh, started naming all these different things and giving them very, very specific names, right? The genus and the species. And of course, they did it before that. They had these, these elaborate polynomials, right? You would name something. <clears throat> if you wanted to name something like a plant, so maybe uh, I could get a, a little water from, I, uh, sorry about that. I'm, uh, it's those damn plants and the pollen out there that's doing it. <clears throat> um, you know, but these long polynomials were, were, were like for example, if you were t trying to describe a lupin, you would say a plant about this tall that has leaves that are shaped like the palms of a hand but have a long stalk of flowers. The, long, the ones on the bottom were large and the ones on the top were smaller as you go up and so on. But they literally did these Latin polynomials and they would say things like, well, it's Nepita floribus interrupti spicatus pedunculatus, you know, and you're supposed to know what, what that really was. Well, good old Carl shortened everything down to a binomial. And of course, they named us <clears throat> 
Homo sapiens, right? The thinker, the thinking man, and way up at the top. So there was this hierarchy. But even Linnaeus secretly said, you know what? Plants reproduce. I've seen it. They have flowers, and I think they have sex. But you're not supposed to say things like that back in, the, in those days. A hundred years later, in comes, thank you very much, in comes our famous Charles Darwin. Thanks so much. And, uh, and of course, you know, there's no, no reason to go on and on about how much Darwin means to the sciences and the science of organic evolution. When he came back, notice that when he came back, he waited for 25 years before he wrote The Origin of Species. Why? Well, he had a very, very Christian wife who said, Chuck, 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 I do not want you writing that kind of stuff. He would sneak down to have his warm milk at night right in his scribbled in down below and so on. What are you doing down there? You know, and, uh, but eventually, you know, you all know the story <clears throat> that in the 1850s, um, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace was about ready to scoop him and, and uh, had the same idea. So he had to push this publication out, which got him in a lot of trouble. Uh, but most of his defenders were not Charles himself, but his writing. And he had lots and lots of scientific, uh, scientific defenders. But he wrote and he wrote and he wrote constantly about plants. He wrote 60 different publications about plants. Plant movement, the power in, of movement in plants in 1880. Then his young son, Francis, found plants to be equally uh, amazing. And so he carried on his father's study and Francis Darwin became really the forefront of understanding plant evolution and understanding the, the um, uh, what did he say? The, not, this is the, uh, Darwin, his father, the power of movement in plants. But he wanted to say that plants were intelligent. And they both talked about regularly that somewhere we think it's mostly in the root, in the very tips of the roots, in the very tips of the apices in the top, where there is a brain-like structure. Something is going on up there. So let's, uh, let's just do a little uh, geology right here, a little paleogeology or whatever. And of course we divide our, uh, let me see, which is the, uh, we divide our geologic time scale here into the Precambrian, which is a very, very long period of time, billions of years. And then we divide the, the, the rest of it into the Paleozoic, early life, the Mesozoic, middle life, and the Cenozoic or more recent life, right? We start with the word zo again, and not that that doesn't mean life, but it also means animals, right? And the whole thing is set up to enable us to understand the differences of <clears throat> species over, over time. Well, when did we show up? You know, well, look, algae show up out in here someplace working their way. Land plants show up uh, in, in here, and then we show up in the last few seconds of the last hour of that. So, you know, who is the most, who has spent the most time on the earth? Who has done the most trial and error, experimentation, and so on? Obviously, plants far, far uh, before that. So the amount of trial and error, evolutionary uh, variations, and so on. Uh, by plants, we've had a lot more time at it. And if we look at the, that, that whole length of 4.6 billion years in a spiral, of course, plants show up uh, way back in here and animals much later on. I'm trying to get to a point here. This really bugs me. Uh, we had to learn all this. Which were the fossils that separated these different groups? And the fossils were always, note, dead animals someplace, right? And so we have these, and especially dinosaurs. Our kids are dinosaur crazy. But they, you know, maybe they would become plant crazy. I don't know. It happens all the time. 
I can be in any kind of a lecture trying to talk about plants and plant biology. If a spider walks by, now everybody goes and wants to see what's going on. But so we divide all of our all of our evolutionary characteristics into those uh, animals that were fossilized there. Well, here's two of my, two of my heroes. One is a paleontologist, Kirk Johnson, who's the curator of of paleontology at the Smithsonian Institution. And my other hero is, is uh, Ray Troll. You've probably seen his t-shirts out there someplace, spawn until you die, or this and that and the other. He's a cartoonist, evolutionist, um, he's fish crazy. He's even got his own band called the Ratfish Rattler, uh, Wranglers or, or whatever. Uh, but he's a, he's a really, really interested, interesting cartoonist evolutionary cartoonist. He has an old Volvo that he drives around. He's up in Ketchikan. And his old Volvo is, he calls it the Evolvo. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, it's never too late to mutate. Uh, he's just really, really intrigued with evolutionary biology. And you, if you want to go online to just Ray Troll art, and look at the t-shirts and posters, and, and it's absolutely hilarious. He did this poster of the fossils of you know, California and uh, Nevada, so you can get that poster and hang it on your wall to see what's there. But you have to look really, really hard to find a damn plant in this thing. You know, it's, <laughs> it's just dead animal after dead animal everywhere. Ah, oh, that's great that they have the animals, but where are the plants? How about the giant sequoias that used to live out here and so on that are fossilized uh, out in, in Nevada? Anyway, he did the same thing with this incredible cartoon, I think, which is really great, showing you the different uh, changes over the, the oops, the Paleozoic, uh, uh, the uh, Mesozoic, and, and has the fossils in place. Notice these big extinctions, of course, are going to be big markers in why some of these other, some species die out and other ones flourish and radiate from there. But I took uh, issue uh, with this and I put my own little cartoon together here. And uh, so you can buy this from me for 10 cents uh, anytime you want. But, um, but anyway, so you, you have in here, uh, you know, in the, in the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic, the evolution of plants right alongside. And of course, we're in the Anthropocene right now. These are nuclear power plants and jets and, <laughs> and deforestation and so on going on up, up, up there. But <clears throat> anyway, so what are these plants uh, anyway? Well, we all know they're green and they have chlorophyll. Well, they all do, but not all of them. Some of them, give them, some of them have given up that habit. Well, there are, they are <coughs> colonies of cells, right? And we'll talk about that in a little bit uh, more. They may be herbaceous, fleshy, or very woody as well. They can be annual or biennial or perennial. So there's all these different variations. They're just not one shots, you know, like animals, you know, born, grow, die, it's over with, you know, type of thing. There's a lot of a lot of variations in it, but they're sessile. They don't move about. So consequently, they can't be sentient. They can't be as important as the kingdom animalia and so on. Well, they move, albeit you know, pretty slowly, and we'll talk about their movement in a little bit. They are all photosynthetic, well, except for, well, they're autotrophic, except for those that are parasites. So some of them have kind of given up on that, they found out, you know, it's a lot easier to parasitize something than it is to do your own work. And so they have parasites as well as commensals. We'll talk more about these in a minute. But the most important thing, I think, that uh, separates animals from plants are their uh, cooperative activities. They're major cooperators. You don't think so. You, you just plant something in the ground and you think that it's going to take care of itself and it can take care of itself and so on, but they immediately go after other organisms to cooperate uh, along with. They have intimate relationships. One very important thing, and you know this very well if you ever tried to pull out an oleander or something like that, uh, they're a lot harder to kill. Look at 
Come on, they're, they're colonial organisms. Chop off one part, it grows back. Chop off a different part, it'll, so, you know, something always pops up there, right? How easy is it to kill an animal? Lop their heads off, it's over with, <laughs> right? You know? Or, you know, take their limbs off, they can't do anything, they can't grow them back or whatever. But think about that, when you're pruning your trees, you know, you find out, oh my gosh, I'm stimulating this damn thing and it's growing even uh, better than, than before. And they defend themselves exceptionally well. So there are no pansies uh, out there. They're, thank you, sorry about that. <laughs> they, uh, they started this uh, symbiosis, sim this cooperative symbiosis with this relationship situation where the original, uh, 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 original uh, prokaryotic cells started to invaginate and capture things like bacteria, ancient bacteria, anaerobic bacteria, or algae, or uh, uh, cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, and so on, and voila, we end up with a eukaryotic cell that is really a symbiosis. How do we know this? Because all of our eukaryotic cells, all these plant cells that have mitochondria and chloroplasts, you can take the chloroplasts out, they'll reproduce themselves. Why? Because they've got their own nuclear material, RNA and, and DNA, similarly with the mitochondria as well. And so cooperation starts there, but it goes a lot faster and farther than this. Beyond the symbiosis, they can be um, uh, epiphytes, as we see in this uh, bromeliad that's growing upon something else. An epiphyte is something that's grow growing upon another plant. If it's an epiphyte, there can be an epizoan as well. But they can also be uh, parasites like this daughter that's invading the cells of another, another plant. They can be carnivorous, like this pitcher plant out here. How about this? This, this thing that everybody wants to kill. Um, you know, I f first thought of this when I lived in Modesto and I thought about the Modesto ashes. In the wintertime when the leaves were off of the Modesto ashes and the mistletoe was green as could be, I couldn't help but think, okay, you know, what's going on here? Could it possibly be that that mistletoe is sending some of the food in the wintertime back into the tree, right? And then uh, benefits from, you know, it, from it going in, in both directions later on in the, in the summertime. And sure enough, that is true. So the interconnections there, now they can become quite a, a mass to uh, cause the vascular tissue to not be able to support movement back and forth. And you know, you might want to, you might not want to let it, let it get this far out, but it's, a, it's, a, it's photosynthesizing, it's green. How can it be considered a full-on parasite? Some other partnerships that they have, obviously, the nitrogen-fixing bacteria in nodules uh, that plants have associations with, with these bacteria. And of course, um, we need to go on and on and on about mycorrhizae, it used to be that every fungus out there was a, was a disease, right? It was something that was going to kill our plant. And now we know that mycorrhiza are significantly important in the transference of materials back and forth, especially phosphorus. So the plant gives up a little bit of carbohydrate for the mycorrhizae. The mycorrhizae uh, can go over and connect to something else. Similarly with the, the nitrogen fixing bacteria that we find in, in, uh, not in uh, legumes and other species of other uh, families of plants um, as well. Um, if, if a plant is a carbohydrate, uh, if, if plants are made up mostly of carbohydrates, right? Starches and sugars and things like that. What are you mostly made up of? Guy, you can't raise your hand. Well, water, yes, but let's, let's remove the water from all of us. Are you mostly carbohydrates? I hope not. You might be really sweet, but you're mostly protein, right? You're protein. Where do you get, what is going on here in this, these uh, uh, bacterial nodules there? Notice this, they're nitrogen-fixing bacteria, right? 
So they can take nitrogen from the atmosphere and fix it into nitrates, nitrites, and so on. Other things that die and rot turn into ammonium type compounds and nitrogen is pulled out of there. The bottom line is, is when you inhale, 78% of that breath is nitrogen. Breathe it out. 78% of nitrogen goes out there. You have no access to nitrogen at all unless it's through plants that you eat or animals that have eaten plants that you've eaten or fungi that you've eaten, etc. And they all owe their business to nitrogen fixing bacteria and this association with other plants. It could be not just uh, uh, with the uh, legumes, but also with alders. There's blue-green algae and nitrogen-fixing things of that nature uh, as well. But we know a lot about these partnerships, right? Because uh, you know, phenomenal floral partnerships. This this is coevolution at its best, where plants evolved to be pollinated by. Uh, birds and butterflies and so on, and butterflies and birds elongate their bills so that they can get farther down into the nectaries and so on, and so coevolution is working phenomenally there. This is a real mutualistic type of partnership. I just found, realized that I'm talking into this thing and I don't need to. I can go wherever I want here, but... <laughs> Old habits die hard, so... But are some of these some of these plants enslavers as well as, as partners, right? Uh, on the left, this is the uh, unicorn plant. Um, it's also known as uh, devil's claw when it's, when it's dry and so on. So that thing hooks up on, onto the leg of uh, some large animal that's moving along through and drops its seeds as it goes along and you get a nice seed dispersal from that. And everybody knows this guy, right? The, the conkle burr, you've been pulling him out of your socks and your dogs for, you know, for, for many, many years. Both, by the way, uh, significant medicinal plants as well. It, and plants make up 99.5% of all the biomass on Earth. There are many more of them. They are a lot bigger than we are. I was hoping that I could get a big enough check for this thing to go, be able to go to Madagascar, but I'm going to have to give the talk a little bit more often. Uh, than, but I've always wanted to go to Madagascar uh, to see these, these uh, baobab trees. <clears throat> uh, but here's one in Mexico that you can, that you can get to. Uh, these, th these plants have short life cycles, longer life cycles, very long life cycles. This is Arbol del Tule. Has anybody seen this tree in, south, in, in Oaxaca? Ah, good for you. What an incredible tree. Um, I, I'm so pleased to announce that my daughter my, uh, named her daughter Tule. Uh, uh, I don't know that she knew about this tree then, but what a great name, I think. But this is one of the, the, the redwoods, one of the many redwoods. But there, it grows uh, throughout the wet places of, of Mexico, especially in Oaxaca. How do we compare in terms of, of longevity, right? You know, everybody said, Joe, you're looking old, you know, here, right? So, you, what happened to the hair things? So, uh, <laughs> but obviously, our ages are very, very uh, short by comparison. I, this wasn't my slide, I borrowed this from, from Shauna, but I don't know who's Who's, who is going to be putting, you know, humans at 122 years here or whatever. But, uh, but anyway, obviously they're very, uh, they can be very old relative to our, ourselves and so on. But plants, right? Here's quaking aspen. And you probably all already know the quaking aspen is really a bunch of branches from a laid over trunk of a tree that are all popping. These are all clones of each other. And... Uh, this could be a very, very large plant that literally is moving from through the ground as it uses nutrients through the ground, pops up here and pops up there. And so if you had a time, a, an aerial camera and a time, li time, time lapse photography, you might be able to see this whole group of pando moving around these quaking aspens for literally thousands of years. And, you know, you can do a DNA fingerprint 
over one part of the grove of the leaf, way over here on the other side of the grove, and the DNA of the two leaves are absolutely identical. They're, they're clones of each other. Same thing with creosote bush. This, this bush that nobody really cares about out in the desert, but it's this magical plant out in the, out in the Mojave Desert. Uh, look at the ring that's being formed right here. This was first observed by flying over it and seeing that there were creosote rings all over the place. Well, they went, when they went out there, they did uh, DNA fingerprints of these leaves and of the other leaves and found that they're absolutely identical. They said, ha ha, what's going on here? They dug down into the center of the clone until they found some old wood some wood that had not been decomposed. Remember, this is out in the desert, so it wouldn't really last for a long time out there. So they dug in there and did radiocarbon dates on the wood that they found in the center of the clone and found that they were in excess of 10,000 years in age. And so some seed landed in the middle here 10,000 years ago, post ice age, and it's been radiating out under the ground and popping up in this, in this ring are we impressed by plants yet? Uh, and California is such a rich place in, in so many ways. Uh, and, you know, it'd be hard. It would really be hard to leave here. We have so many different ecosystems, so many different great mountain ranges, and so many different uh, uh, superlatives. But when you think of the fact that we have the tallest trees in the world, the, the coast redwoods, that are in excess of 400 feet tall, 400. Now, the average story of a, of a commercial building is 10 feet, and so that's 40 stories tall, and they get their water up on the top of it with no noise, quietly, you know, all the way up there. No pumps going on the whole time. The bristlecone pines in excess of 5,000 years, and if you haven't been to the White Mountains um, and seen the bristlecone pines, put it on your list, do it now the oldest living non-clonal trees species in, in the world. We also have the giant sequoias, right? The, the, the largest living things in the world. Oh, no, no, blue whales are bigger, you know, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. Core out a, a giant sequoia. You can drop in two blue whales, three or four orcas, a whole bunch of, of dolphins and everything else, too. Sorry. You're wrong. So, are plants intelligent? Well, they dominate Earth's biomass. They have a long history on Earth. Are they more advanced than, than we are? We just, we, we just showed up. We're the younger brother out there, right? They uh, feed themselves in one way or another. They can defend themselves. They breathe without lungs. No energy required, thank you. Can they see, taste, smell, hear, feel? Do they solve problems? Can they remember? Can they, can they learn? Yes to all of these things. If you go back to what I started with, the, the fact that they are colonial organisms, they have a modular plan, right? Just like the internet that you see here, you can't destroy all of it, but there's some memory in some parts of it all along the way. Out at the very tip of every root tip, there's the same genetic information, those stem cells, if you wish, those clonal cells that are capable of reproducing the entire plant. And they're sending information back and forth. When they wander through the ground and they even get close to a toxic substance, they bend and turn and go in the other direction. So oh, we have five senses. Well, they've got those and probably 15 or 20 more senses than, than we do. They're compared to like, you know, flocks of birds or clowns. They have emergent behaviors, right? They're colonial organisms. That's why I said you can, you know, cut off a limb and it'll, it'll grow back. Or you could, you know darn well, you know, if you've ever tried to take out a large tree all the way down to the bottom and you turn around and something is popping up from the, from the bottom over there and it'll produce the very same thing that you're trying to to get rid of. So they have this distributed um, intelligence. And it all starts with, of course, these phenomenal roots. Then Darwin was, was right. There's something with these roots. They're very, very brain-like. If you take the 
typical rye plant that's just an annual. In, in, it's, you know, once it finally gets mature enough, there's 13 million uh, roots in there, uh, surface area of 237 square meters, 386 miles of roots. That's a lot of information gathering going on. And every one of those cells has the same information as the others do. And so if a piece of the root gets cut, you know, uh, gets destroyed, the other root will continue on. Do they, um, can they taste? They taste for positive and negative ions. They search for water. Uh, they sense and move around uh, obstacles. They avoid toxins. They measure, anyway, it goes on and on and on. They have senses. They are sentient. They're sen uh, capable of receiving information and then acting upon it. They have much higher levels of taste parameters than, than we do, not only qualitative, but quantitatively as well. And can they plan ahead? Can they store information for the future? When there's an abundance of phosphorus out there, when there's an abundance of magnesium, when there's an abundance of calcium, you don't just, they just don't go and get what they want, feel satisfied, satiated, and, and quit right there. They bring it in and continue to store it against the concentration gradient, using energy, putting it away to be used later on, putting it in, in the bank, planning ahead. Do they touch? Well, everybody knows this about, about the plants, the Venus flytrap, tendrils wrapping around things and so on. Um, uh, they have uh, uh, you know, triggering of seed dispersal, you know, their, their touch is very, very uh, sensitive. You can read action potentials right through the cells, the wet cells of the, of the plant, so you can see the, 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 the uh, electrical responses jumping as things move, move along. Root tips are very, very touch sensitive uh, um, as well. And obviously, they are very, very responsive to light of different sort. They perceive visual stimuli, not just the tips or the tops, but the leaves, the roots. If light gets down into the roots, especially blue lights, it stimulates root, and the root will send up information, or it'll send it to the, the potential seed for, uh, for germinating. There's receptors uh, throughout the plant. They measure photo periods. They know when to sprout. They know when to start sending sugars down, when to bring them back up again, when it's time to break bud, when it's time to set flowers, and so on. And you physicists are going to have to help me with this. But this photograph in the lower right, and everybody knows that just like uh, uh, us, uh, plants respond to visual, the visual spectrum. And they certainly perceive all these different rays that are outside the, the uh, visible light spectrum. But uh, they prefer the blue violets and the, and the reds in very, very specific wavelengths to be stimulated to, uh, to do photosynthesis. But apparently, somebody help me out here, this is a photograph that demonstrates both the fact that light is, is a uh, particle and is an electronic uh, wavelength um, as well. I won't ask you to go on into that because you'll just make me look foolish. Um, <laughs> because I don't understand it my, myself. But, uh, we know that they can detect, uh, detect chemical uh, uh, BVOCs, biological uh, 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 volatile organic compounds, that they receive information that stimulates, that information is moved through the plant and that will stimulate thorn production, different leaf production, hardness of the leaf production, you know, activity. So they will literally respond. Um, this, Carnegie that, you know, met this guy at, uh, at Stanford University, uh, and he's working with Deepak Chopra, uh, above all things, and others, uh, working on the, the, the chemistry and photobiology of, of, uh, of plants. But, you know, we all know that plants will move towards light. You move your plant around, and the leaves will go in that direction. If you're germinating, 
a seed, it will, you know, those young cotyledons or the new leaf will bend towards the light and all those kinds of things. But they're doing what, they're, what they like to call midnight experiments. Um, when the, when the, the funders don't know what they're really, uh, they're really doing at night in the laboratories. Um, but they're doing things like they're producing all these different incredible compounds that seem to stimulate us. All right? And I'll just give you one. Ayahuasca. And so they're making ayahuasca, they're volatilizing ayahuasca, which is a very, very powerful uh, hallucinogenic compound produced in plants. And the roots and the plants that are growing up to it go directly to the ayahuasca. Right? Just saying. <laughs> Can they hear? Well, obviously, if you're growing in the ground and things are stomping on the ground, earth is the vector, there's all kinds of experimentation now um, in Europe, uh, there's a whole suite of researchers that are that are that are putting um, uh, s uh, sound sensitive uh, electrodes in the in the ground, and they're hearing all the different sounds of the Earth itself, and you can they can actually uh, separate when a nematode is going through, an earthworm is going through, when there's battles between different kinds of insects. Um, but plants produce sounds as well. And there's research now that demonstrates that not only do they make sounds that are in response to injuries and so on, but they have different sounds for different kinds of energies. Injuries. Different sounds for different kinds of injuries. Okay, the same plant will produce one vibration sound with one injury and a different vibration sound for a different kind of injury. Including, are you ready? the sounds of chainsaws and things like that. So um, lots more on, on that. All you have to do is go online and find out about it. So they produce secondary metabolites. How many, how many compounds do we produce? We produce plenty of, of proteins and things like that, but how many things do we really go after with animal products as opposed to plant products? Secondary metabolites. Um, include uh, alkaloids like caffeine, nicotine, lipids, cannabinoids, oils, terpenoids, flavonoids, plant hormones, salicylic acid. That's probably one of the first medicines taken from willows uh, to be able to uh, grow them. But lots of other plant hormones, auxins, gibberellins. We're using this in so many different uh, agricultural treatments now and so on. Dicoria, the wild yams, this is probably one of the major uh, sources of uh, birth control uh, pills now, unless they're trying to take that away from you too uh, in, the, in the near future. But um, these, these compounds are absolutely phenomenal. I would like to recommend this as a bathroom table book, I mean a coffee table book. <laughs> but this little, this book called Wicked Plants by Amy, uh, Amy Stewart, uh, these, are the, these are the main chapters in it. Aconites, ayahuasca, betel nuts, castor beans, coyotillo, curare. Uh, oops, curare twice. It was a really popular chapter. Uh, <laughs> deadly nightshade, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are the compounds that will kill you um, or elate you or help you or ease your pain or all sorts of, of different things as well. All plant uh, compounds. This guy, Stefano Mancuso, is an Italian at the University of Florence in, in Italy. He doesn't know that I have a bromance going with him. <laughs> um, it's an unrequited type of bromance. But uh, his books are amazing. I'm going to show you some of the pictures of them later on. He says that intelligence is a property of life, from amoebas to multicells. There's different differences are only quantitative, but not qualitative. I mean, yes, uh, that they all solve problems. They only at different speeds and different times. He is the director of, and believe it or not, there are numerous departments now around the world. He is the chairman of the Department of Plant Neurobiology. Hear that, right? And neurobiology is an up and coming research science, you know, throughout the world. Okay, 
Memorize this and repeat it back uh, to me. <laughs> I know this is a little, I, I tried this many times to, to, to simplify this as much as possible, but this is really meaningful to me, right? Here is light, right? Here's that chlorophyll molecule and a few enzymes and so on. Using the raw materials of carbon dioxide and water, you can build, thanks to light energy, you can take chemical, chemical energy and add that <clears throat> radiant energy and produce a much larger, more powerful molecule, a carbohydrate, right? That's the magic of photosynthesis, right? That is the alchemy, if you wish, of photosynthesis. And what do we do with those carbohydrates? First, they're small, right? They start with as three carbon carbohydrates, then sixes, and they go on and on. But you can make glucose with a six carbon. You can add that to fructose and turn it into sucrose, table sugar, white death, you know, uh, <laughs> things like that. But you can also take glucose and turn it into starches and store it, put it away. Or you can even make cellulose with it and you make trees and plants with the same molecule. You can also burn that molecule through the cellular respiration process. That's the mitochondria in there. Tear it all apart, release the energy, capture that energy into ATP molecules, grab some of it as the molecules are being pulled apart, take the energy and build the ATP molecules. If glucose was a, a nine volt battery, then the ATPs were hearing aid batteries, little bitty things, right? And you use those, that's the energetic coin of the realm. We need, we need ATP then to do the work of life. That's what work is, biosynthesis, biodegradation, heat, motion, life, right? But it also is the work of species and communities and ecosystems and so on. This equation is marvelous and it's simple. Then it's taken a few billion years to evolve, but nevertheless, that's what we get out of it. That's what that equation does for us. It gives us biological diversity. It gives us biomes and ecosystems all over the world. These aren't just species that, with pretty pictures to look at. These are oxygen producing uh, uh, biological diversity forests and marshes, wetlands and deserts and no matter where you go, the millions and millions of species of life that enable us to survive, that enable all other species to survive, no matter where you go. And it all starts back at that nasty little equation, oversimplified, but nevertheless, all it takes is some light, some carbon dioxide, some water, and that incredible molecule called chlorophyll. So plants are providers of food and shelter and fiber and energy and drink and medicines. Pharmacology goes on and on and on. I used to ask students at the beginning of the semester, how dependent upon uh, life are you? How dependent upon Earth? How dependent upon you know Earth's resources are you? And I got everything from uh, 15, 18 percent to. You know, every once in a while, somebody go, a bunch of dummies, it's 100%, you know, right? It's 100%. We are 100. You can't get any more dependent than 100% on life it, itself, okay? <clears throat> Besides that, can you imagine having a learning environment or a healing environment in a hospital or in a classroom for kids or whatever without plants in it? Can you imagine not getting, not, not just being blown away by the beauty of life, of flight, of the sound of bees in the forest and so on? We have co-evolved with plants, right? We're lucky that they started and we hopped on and we got to enjoy the benefits and the biological 
diversity of life. But for many of them, are we their, uh, are they our slaves or are we their servants, right? And if you've ever read Michael Pollan, in his, one of his first books was called, um, somebody help me out, The Botany of Desire, yeah. <laughs> right? The Botany of Desire, right? Who is working for who? You know, all these plants are in there. You got your, all your house plants going. They're just going, oh, well, I don't have to do anything today. I just, you know, look green and beautiful. They water me. You know, <laughs> they put the fertilizers in there and so on. I'm, I'm, I'm good. You know, they pollinate me. They cross-pollinate me. They bring me, you know, all these great things. And ecological services, oxygen, oxygen production. I mean, we're at 21% now because of plants. We weren't always there. It took them a long time to get there, but we're at 21% thanks to plants. Carbon sequestration, flood control, watershed maintenance, climate amelioration, pollution control. Now, how many times when you go to the supervisors, you go to the planning commission, and somebody's going to try to destroy a grassland, a weed patch, or whatever it is, and you're trying to sit up there and say, can we put... Now, I know you've told me how much the developer is going to pay for this property and how much it's going to cost to fix, or to do the infrastructure and all those kinds of things, how, and all the benefits that are going to be there. But do you ever see on the other side of the column, you know, the, ecologic, the number for the ecological services that are removed once that natural area gets moved away, right? Once it gets taken away. There's no quicker way to literally stop ecosystem services than to put concrete and asphalt on, on top of it, right? But, and, and then when we're fighting, screaming, to try to save the last patches of wetlands or vernal pools or whatever, they still laugh at you. Like, you know, you're some kind of a hippie, you know, green, greeny, right, whatever. So, is there life without plants? Obviously, absolutely Im impossible. This is Michael Pollan, who also can't grow here. Um, <laughs> but Botany of Desire was the book that I was talking about. Fabulous omnivore's dilemma. He's moved into some really incredible stuff. So he's looking at psychotropic drugs, you know, and, and the new revolution of, <clears throat> of taking these very, very serious drugs uh, uh, psilocybin, LSD, ayahuasca, all of these kinds of things, and using them very, very carefully, medicinally, for healing, for anxiety control, for end-of-life situations, on and on and on. Uh, and his last book, How to Change Your Mind, is pretty spectacular, right? He's also an incredible foodie. And if you've ever watched any of his food programs, try um, Cooked. Um, why do we cook our food, you know? And so that's, I don't know why I just thought about that, but, um, but I was thinking about how small our teeth were and how we, we can't really rip and tear, you know, all the time. But anyway, how many of you read this book? No, oh, just a few of you. This is a wonderful book. This is the gal that brought the inspiration for the, uh, the Overstory, that book, right? Some of you really like that book. It was her inspiration in one of the big stories. Another inspiration of hers was, um, what's the animated movie? A Avatar, Avatar, right? Anyway, she's the connecting woman, the connector. She traced, looking at trees side by side like this, could this tree that's producing carbohydrates send s some of her carbohydrates to another tree of the same species, right? Dig down carefully, net, needle by needle, pulling it all apart, finding a web of fungi. Hmm, what's going on here? And so looking at the fungi more closely. Well, it goes from tree to root to fungi, mycorrhizae, to another root, to another tree. Are you needing help? I'll send you some sugar all the way across. How are you doing? Not doing so well today. I'll send you some back. Both ways. Same species, different species as well, right? 
they also know how to identify. They prefer giving their, their gifts to their offspring first. They know who their offspring are. Not because their root touches another root of their offspring, but because there's this mycorrhizal association in, in between. So this book is not just a, it's a fabulous book because it's all about her research and her fight to establish the fact that this is, these are facts. This is the truth. And she's trying to fight this in a man's scientific world, to go up against the men's scientists all the time, foresters, right? Nothing, uh, nothing more masculine than a, than a forester. I love the fact that, you know, now the Humboldt State is now Cal Poly Humboldt, right? And that they're not foresters, they're forest ecologists, right? And there's a huge invitation of the Native American communities wisdom and practices into that institution now. And you've got to learn more about fungi. That's all there is to it. Uh, Paul Stamets' book uh, and, uh, and numerous others. But if you haven't watched this film, you've got to watch this one too. You, will, you won't be the same person after you, <laughs> after you watch this film. Trust me, you, it will blow your mind. Talk about blow your mind botany, this is blow your mind fungi for sure. This is one of the finest movies I've ever, ever seen. Oh, why don't you talk, talk to me? <laughs> Stefan. <laughs> this guy, he is too funny. Catch him on YouTube. He's, he's got this, <clears throat> he's got this wonderful Italian accent and so on, and he's talking about his plants and his experiments and so on. He is a brilliant researcher. His papers go on and on and on in terms of his scientific papers. But these are his, um, his popular books because he wants to make sure that people are, are getting the idea, getting the message, you know, without having to go to his scientific publications all the time. Start with uh, Brilliant Green. Start right there, The Surprising History of Science and Plant Intelligence, then go to The Incredible Journey and The Revolutionary Genius of Plants and so on. And this, these, these guys are what give me my inspiration too. The research that they're doing and also the fact that they're trying to get the word out. Plants are intelligent, they're phenomenal. And then here is you know, this has got to be the, the finest writer, author, woman, you know. She's a scientist at the uh, SUNY in uh, Syracuse, SUNY uh, State University of New York at Syracuse. She um, is a forest ecologist. She's a trained scientist, but also a native of the Potawatomi Nation. And this braiding sweetgrass is the one that you should have at your bedside so that you can read a chapter a night with your partner and read them back and forth to each other. And it will, your life will grow incredibly. And then it will also simplify your life. It will make you think, my gosh, what, these things that I've been doing are right on. These things that I haven't been doing, I need to do, right? And so um, she, it, uh, in one of her chapters, she talks about the Thanksgiving um, address and at, at the Native American school near, nearby her home, they don't do the Pledge of Allegiance. Her, her daughter couldn't do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, yeah. a, a flag, you know, right? And, what, and wait a minute, she's been raised in the woods, she's been raised with the, her, her mother's ability to show her how to eat berries, you know, how to be, make baskets, how to live it, you know, well in the woods and so on. And, and her, her daughter came and said, there's nothing in this Pledge of Allegiance that says anything about the gifts that we re, have received from the one and only earth upon which we live, you know. And so there is a, the Thanksgiving address that they say at their school, it is a Thanksgiving address for water, Thanksgiving address for trees, for animals, for plants, 
and on and on and on. Sometimes the address goes on and on and on, which is fine. They do it once a week or whatever. And they don't have a bill of rights. They have a bill of responsibilities, right? And in her book, her one beautiful book, she shares with you the fact that biological diversity, especially plants, she's a plant biologist, but biological diversity is pouring gifts out to us. And we know, we all know precisely what they are. But her point is, where is the reciprocity? In native tra uh, in traditions, whenever there is a gift, there is a reciprocal thanks, a gift of whatever it may be. And so think about that just a little bit and read her books and think about what can that gift be, right? You can start right here by sharing what you've heard tonight and say, wow, when we, when we sit down at Thanksgiving, you know, besides thanking the love that we have of our family and our peace in the nation or whatever it happens to be, we need to talk about, you know, what we're, what we're receiving right here, right? And how it got here. How can we give thanks back? First thing she says is, get dirty. Get your hands in the ground, plant, grow, share that with your children, help them see what, what plants do when they grow, the marvels of, of biology and so on. And try to figure out your way. She says every species has its gift that has been provided to, to us. What about that bacteria, that rhizobium bacteria, a gift of nitrogen fixation, right? All right, you wanna say thanks? Keep them going, keep them alive, keep the soils healthy and so on. You wanna, you wanna stop the process? Throw some asphalt on top of it, or concrete, or, or, or whatever. So the, the gift of, uh, the gifts given us by biological diversity should have reciprocation. And that's the, her main point. So have you thanked a plant today? I hope that you do. And that's the end of my story. So. Um, <laughs>